A very warm welcome to everyone. The six-day program being organized by BD Heritage Centre for Gerontology Department of Social Work, Bharati Dasan University, Tiruchirappalli, Heritage Foundation of India, Hyderabad, Telangana, and Transcat People's Solutions Private Limited, Bengaluru. Today is the fifth in the series of six-day session. Today's session will be handled by Dr. K. R. Gangadhar, Chairman Heritage Foundation, Hyderabad. By any chance, uh, Dr. Nalini has joined, Professor Nalini. Professor Nalini, are you there? I'm not able to see her name. Fine, another two minutes to go. We'll start the session at uh, 11.30. Welcome everyone. So I see, I see Lucy from Nairobi. Good to have you here, Lucy. Welcome, welcome, Lucy, for this Jeez. webinar session. Dr. Gangadharan, with your permission, can we start? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Okay, a very warm welcome to everyone for today's uh, webinar session. It's a part of six-day orientation program on gerontological social work organized by BDU Heritage Centre for Gerontology, Department of Social Work, Bharati Dasan University, Trichirapalli, Tamil Nadu, Heritage Foundation of India, Hyderabad, Telangana, and Transcat People Solutions Private Limited, Bengaluru, Karnataka. And I request everyone to keep your mic in silent mode and do not click on the present button during the webinar. You are requested to type in a questions in the chat box in case you have any clarifications. Questions may be answered with time availability. Thank you for your cooperation. Today's session will be on social work administration and management of services for elderly. Very Dr. K. R. Ganga and Chairman. Heritage Foundation and one of the organizers of this week long knowledge event. Professor and head of the Department of Social Work, Bharati Dasan University, Tirichirapulli. Professor P. Ilango, Chair School of Social Sciences and Professor of Social Work, Coordinator of BDU Heritage Center, Bharati Dasan University, Tirichirapulli. I also welcome all faculty members and other officials of Bharati Dasan University. I welcome all professors, teachers, practitioners and all my friends from all over India as well as abroad, wish you all a very fruitful webinar. Let me introduce Dr. K. R. Gangadharan, Chairman, 
Heritage Foundation. And obtained his postgraduate degree from Madras School of Social Work. And after completing his course, he joined Lucas TVS Chennai and worked as a personal officer for nearly four years and then moved to Hindustan Motors Earth Moving Equipment Division as IR manager. Later, he joined Apollo Hospitals and worked as general manager operations for nearly six years. In 1994, he established India's premier geriatric medical facility, Heritage Medical Center at Hyderabad, and simultaneously started training street kids and youth from poor livelihoods beside care for the elderly. He was involved in the review of the Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act 2007 and served as a member of the core group on welfare of elderly citizens constituted by the National Human Rights Commission. He was the board member of International Federation on Aging from 2004 to 2014, became the global president during 2012 to 14, located in Toronto, and also board member of International Association of Home Aging during 2004 to 2009, Washington, D.C. He has worked with the United Nations and World Health Organization in the capacity of temporary advisor and resource faculty by the WHO, SEAR, and hence shared experiences with various countries every year in different countries. In 2015, he was involved in the development of the global strategy and action plan on aging and health convened by WHO at Geneva. He was invited to speak by the UN ESCAP for several years. In 2012, he was invited to be a part of the global panel at the United Nations, New York, during the open-ended working group discussions on older persons. Heritage Medical Center, a home away from home, is the first private Indian hospital for the elderly that has grown in size and expanded in scope since its inception in 1994. The hospital's heritage Elder care service, a pioneer in providing service for the aged in India, catered to both their physical and psychological needs, thereby offering services in diverse fields. May I welcome the pioneer in this field, Dr. K. R. Gangadharan. It is over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, James, for uh, introducing me. I don't know where from such a long presentation of my personality has been involved. I just thought it's enough to say I'm at there. Running Heritage Foundation, that gives me more pride than anything else. Nevertheless, uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, place my deep sense of gratitude to uh, Dr. Ilongo, particularly Dr. Mangaleshwaran and the other team of uh, Bharati Dasan University Department, Department of Social Work. Because they have taken this program so beautifully to this uh, level. I think we are, uh, Dr. Ilongo, despite all his health problems, has been extensively, I would say, relentless. And uh, I don't know whether I will be able to do what he is doing with this kind of health condition. Yes, I, I really want to you know, express uh, my deep sense of gratitude for taking this forward. And Heritage Foundation has been, you know, instrumental in uh, you know getting this Bharati Dasan University Center for Gerontology established. It's taken practically two years for us to reach a stage of, you know, even wanting to you know have a meeting. So we are very grateful to them for. Uh, you know, this happen. And uh, yes, I want to definitely again uh, place my deep sense of gratitude to four speakers in this week, Monday, you know, with Dr. Suman, who beautifully demonstrated what casework means, followed by Dr. Nira, who mentioned what is community organization. I'm sorry, Dr. I mean, Father Irudhai Raj, who mentioned about group work, and yesterday, Dr. Basha. I think all Everyone individually made exceptional presentations, and I think uh, for a person like me from social work brand, you know, background, went back to 1974-76 days of Madras Club Social Work where we learned everything. But after that, I think uh, there has been a lot of change between then and now. I think uh, we are moving to a situation where we are all looking at the policy making and policy advocacy, we are looking at the programs being implemented by the state government and central government. I'm also very happy to acknowledge here Mrs. Ghazala Minai, who happened to be the chairman of the committee that was constituted to review the maintenance and welfare of parents and seniors in this act. And she was also instrumental in a lot of you know programs that have taken place during the one of a long tenure that she had in the Ministry of Social Justice. 
and all other friends. Let me explain to you a few things that I've learned in the you know, last 25, it's my 27th year of running Heritage Medical Center, though I moved backward to give it to my two daughters to manage, but I think there are a lot of things that are very important. I will go to the first slide. Now, uh, we are talking about social work administration and management of services for the senior citizens. You know, uh, Dr. Bhattik, can you go to the first one? Yeah. First slide. Can we go to the second slide, please? Okay. Now, I think we are, the reason, you know, uh, I'm going to the demography is to highlight the fact that all along we have been talking about aging population. We have been talking to the government of India and all other policy makers to talk about aging as a policy. So it, it, it gains importance. But today we are talking about services. Now I just go, want to go back. One of my experiences in 1983 when I joined Apollo Hospital as a general manager of operations. I did not know what is hospital management, but I gained a lot of you know foothold on management of hospitals. When I started running their facilities in Hyderabad and you know few other places, I came to Hyderabad, started running them. At that point of time, there was nothing called hospital management. There was nothing called hospital administration except in perhaps in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, they had a department of hospital administration. They were teaching for their own faculty members so that you know they were able to become supermans and others. But the field of hospital management took you know probably 10 to 12 years later it gained importance. I think today hospital administrators are highly paid. That never existed 25 years ago. Now that is the growth of hospital management and healthcare in this country, which has now become a big billion, hundreds of uh, you know millions or rather few billion dollars, I think it's about 30, 40 billion dollars industry it's become. Hospital administration has gained importance. Same thing in the case of um, gerontology, social work. Now they're all becoming huge. They're all becoming really huge. Now looking at, you know, current number of 140, 145, you know, million plus or minus, at least 25% of them or 20% of them are in a position to afford care. Whereas 70% of them are said to be below poverty line. I'm talking about people who are 60 plus. So services are needed in this country for both people who don't have money and people who have money. I'm very sure I remember I heard the Dr. Neera, uh, Neera mentioning about this. Poor and the non-poor. Services are required for both. Social casework is not something that's only for the poor. It is very much applicable to the rich. Whether it's how over affluent he is. I remember traveling with one of those biggest India's list in this country, who was running a few hundreds of crores, drug company. I was going with them and we were having lunch in Copper's Chimney, Bombay, uh, Bandra. He went to Kapo Chimney. This gentleman asked for some beer. He wanted to drink beer. I don't drink, drink. I mean, I don't take any liquor. So he wanted to have a beer. He asked for the beer. The beer came. And he showed him the, you know, I, normally they show the, you know, the temperature of the bottle. He showed, he said, okay, bring it. And he also ordered some food. Now when the bottle came, he was very unhappy that it was not as cold as it was shown to him. And I can tell you, he abused him and he said, I don't want the food. He kept some money there, whatever was the food or the cost. He walked out saying, I just don't want to have food here. Then one copper chimney, we went to copper chimney near Amitabh Bachchan's house in Lepale. While going, he told me something interesting. He says, I get angry Gangadharan because of my temperature, my personality. But he told me something interesting. I am so rich. I have so much of money. I am giving you know money to a lot of people. One thing I, I realize, when I take idli, my idli made by my cook and the idli made in your, in your home are not different. Just because I have a lot of money, I am not able to take idli 
made out of diamond. See, that is the you know the richness and the poor. At the end of the day, it is same for all. I think this is something that we need to bear in mind when you are talking about social gerontology and related care administration. I think the care services are on the rise in this country, whether it's for poor or for the affluent. And therefore, there is a lot of opportunity in this field, not only to get onto the field, but also to deliver a lot of services. One of the things that I may not be able to, you know, talk about everything, but I will only mention overall aspects of management. We are looking at the. There are more women. Please understand. My mother personally lived till ninety-three. She had a widowhood of practically thirty-three years. She had a widowhood of thirty-three years. I have my mother-in-law today who has got a widowhood of twenty-two, and she's eighty-four. So widowhood has a lot of problems. My mother was bedridden for ten years. By my mother-in-law, on the other hand, you won't believe it. At eighty-three, she completed her PhD in uh, Sanskrit. You know that is the aging we are talking about. That's the aging we are talking about. Now, when you are going to eighty and above, as I told you, there are eighty and above who are very healthy. There are eighty and above who are unhealthy, and we are, the number is in, increasing. According to the latest data available, the number of sixty years, sorry, number of eighty years are growing at six hundred percent, which means the next twenty years of time, you will find a lot of people wanting a lot of services because they are extremely old. Now I want to tell you there are some of us who travel a lot. I remember those days when I used to go to airport. You will find one or two wheelchairs. You will never find more than two or three wheelchairs. But today you are booking wheelchairs, and in every gate entrance there will be ten to fifteen again yeah. your know, wheelchairs. The entire airport had two airport two wheelchairs, but today you have every gate has fifteen twenty airports, and you are paying five hundred six hundred rupees to book and go. That is the demand for aging communities, which are increasing in number. They would all need a lot of support. That's something that you need to really plan when you're talking about ad administration, social care. Now, hundred and hundred years and above is also not a small number. It has gone to six lakh. When I got into the field of aging in 1994, the number of older people in this country was less than 60 million. That was 25 years ago, and it's 104, and today it's about 135, 140, and it's growing every day. It's growing. As we, are, it's evident from the number of people who are serving. Who we are serving. I think I want people to understand the number is on the rise. Therefore, the services are going to be more. Next. Now, nuclear families. It's 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 something that you see the phenomenal increase of nuclear households from less than 100 million in 2001. It's gone to 130 million. Imagine people were living those days together. not anymore they are all disappearing not that everyone is not living but the number is disappearing in hyderabad i see a lot of you know particularly some some you know religious family i won't use the word religious some you know families live together if i go to the old city i see some families where four generations live in that house there will be probably around 40 45 From the oldest to the youngest, there will be about forty people. There will be four generation families living. It is interesting to find, despite that, the nuclearization is increasing. And the next one, if you see the slide, next one will be on the, you know, expectancy. Older people, I think. Imagine, I know this was about fifty-six years, just about twenty years ago. It's already touched sixty-eight, and we are an average of sixty-seven. and this number will go to 80 over a period of time now when i look at my age and i look at my father's age my father lived 66 years but today an average person lives a healthy life at 75 to 80 if they have been you know prudent in their life what to do and what not to do those who have not followed it prob probably are uh, people who don't maintain good health Who are probably needing assistance. 
But it, this may not be the case in the case of poor people in the villages who may not follow good, you know, sorry, so who may not follow good, you know, discipline and therefore the longevity. I think one of the biggest discussion took place in the last 20 years' time. The longevity is increasing, is the quality of life improving? I remember again this point was very clearly emphasized by Mrs. Nira, Dr. Nira, who mentioned about it. We are not in India focusing on quality of life as much as longevity of life. Life is increasing, quality, I mean, the longevity is increasing. What are we doing about it? This is a study, very interesting to find the study. And that I was part of this called from the United uh, UNFP. The study found, I have just taken a few statistics which I thought will be useful for highlighting what is going to happen. The number of people who need assistance with activities of daily living is on the rise. Imagine in this bathing, 6.2 people, percent of people require assistance in bathing. And the number is probably going down as it goes on down the order. So I want to go back to 94, 95. In 95, we started home care services. There were people whom we are deputing our what is called the auxiliary nurses, ANMs. We were sending them to the homes of the people who came to us from, let's say, a brain surgery or a cataract surgery, sorry, a cancer surgery. They came to our hospital. And after some time, they wanted to go back home because they were all feeling homesick. And at that point of time, we started giving them the bedside assistance, what we call ANMs. But then we realized that we were not having enough number those days in 95 itself. So we started training with the help of UNICEF Hyderabad. We started training people. One set of people were street kids. Another set of people were from slums. And we found street kids were not staying in the job, and therefore we continued to work with the slums. Of we picked up primarily boys and girls, and the municipal corporation of Hyderabad gave us a lot of support to do this program. I think this is one of the biggest thing that we did was training people in Hyderabad. From '95, we started having bedside assistants training them on the work. I think this is one of the biggest challenge. You really look back. If I look back and say I'm a social worker, yes, I think this is something that we have done. Two things. One. We made youth productive and we ensured that old people were not going to struggle for want of manpower to assist them. I think that is something that we really did. And let me tell you, the situation is changing now. Those days, we were cleaning the patient and changing the dress if they were wetting themselves. But today, the bedside assistants are all telling, you won't clean. He was diapers. The time has changed when the staff have now said, we are not going to uh, keep, keep doing all this work unless you give us a bedpan. We are not going to use bedpan anymore. Please understand, most of our facilities today, we have a bedpan, but both the families also don't want. They are also telling, use diapers. And diapers are expensive. And during COVID time, diapers have become prohibitively expensive because you know the stocks are not available in India. I think this is something that we need to bear in mind. Activities of daily living, need for this facility, will need for this kind of a support is going to rise. If old people are going to live longer, the longevity is going to increase. Unless a person is following very good regimen of good services, you know, good quality of life in terms of mental health as well as physical health, the demand for these services will increase. So now you look at in, in India today, I think every city has established home care services. Quite a number of companies have come up. And I can tell you with all that, people are desperate because they're not getting people they want. It's becoming expensive. And during COVID time, people don't want, for example, we are very hesitant to send anybody to anybody's home. Because we don't know where the disease comes from. We are very worried whether we will send a girl, with the, you know, with the person with the disease to go to, you know, that place for, uh, you know, with a probable uh, chance of what is called asymptomatic uh, problem. Or the person whom they are serving will have this problem. So both sides are extremely cautious. So what happened in the process, I was asking, you know, how much is going to cost some people to wear PPE equipment? 
it's prohibitively expensive, prohibitively expensive. Not families will be able to afford it, especially when they're old. Old people, if they start paying the money, they don't have money. The families are not going to pay so much. I think this is one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have. I think this is where social administration comes into the big way in terms of what they can do. The next one. Disability among the senior citizens. I'm sure Mrs. Ghazala will remember. This is part of our discussion. When we were discussing on, uh, at some point of time, there was a committee constituted under our chairmanship to devise a program for distribution of assistive living devices. This took place about five, six years ago. This was another study of the BKPA, you know, a building knowledge base um, project, or a population aging in India project, which very clearly found the disability among the elderly. And you will find that disability is in two different ways. One side is vision. Understand if there is a disability vision, understand the care is going to become a big struggle. It's going to become a big struggle. And hearing people can cause a lot of problems to service providers. Hearing people are not easy to manage. They can really cause us a lot of problems. And I'm going to talk somewhere across on the walking and uh, falls in India and what's happening around the world. Chewing. There are enough number of studies in Andhra Pradesh. I'm talking about Andhra Pradesh then and Andhra Pradesh and Telangana today. Huge number of studies where including world women were keeping the cigar in their mouth and smoking. The cigar will be inside the mouth. It won't be outside. It will be inside. They were chewing, they were smoking it inside, and most of them suffering a lot of cancer because of that. They don't understand what they want, they cannot be without. And speaking difficulty means huge number of depression problems, violence, anger, irritation, everything happens. And memory people are a different lot altogether. I remember I went to, you know, uh, um, uh, John Hopkins, must be around 20, 22 years ago, to see the facility. When I went there, one lady came to me and received me. And she's talked to me. And she talked to me as if she knows me for the last 20 years of time. She narrated all the incidents that she met with me the last 20 years. And she kept telling. Then somebody came running to me. The person who was to receive me came running to me. Don't worry about it. She's a person suffering dementia. Now, understand, I need to be sensitive to that. I knew when I entered, okay case of you know, mental disorder, let me not give her any impression. So I talked to her as if I knew her. I kept talking to her. Understand, this is one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have. And this is a fact that we have to face as the number goes up. The next one. Now, key facts, living arrangements. Now, this number is rising in India. Living alone is on the rise. It is not any more small like before. The number is rise. And I'm particularly talking about women because they live alone more than a man, men because they, they get married earlier. And I don't want to go back to the you know, academic input, except to say 10% of the women live alone. Unfortunately, just read the last paragraph. Tamil Nadu is one state where it is more than 25%. Extraordinarily high. And the ministry, when you ask the ministry, ministry said Tamil Nadu is the only state where every district has a old age home. Understand this is the reason. We don't want. Women predominantly occupy at least in a lot of places 50 to 60 percent of the, you know, the number of facilities are available, 50 to 60 people are all useful. Then comes, you know, the Rural and urban. The arrangements change because the marital status. The question is, I can tell you, in a facility like what we run, there are pensioners who say we will pay for our services. We don't want our children to pay. There are plenty of widows. I can. Our experience in a healthcare facility is about eighty percent of our. Uh, residents are all women. 80% are women. Only 20% will be men. And understand, majority of them are widows. I would say widows alone come there 
widowers don't come. 90% of the widowers die. You know, they are hardly there. They don't come at all because the families look after them. There is always a factor. Women continue to receive less care than the men in the families. There are enough number of studies to say so. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we are going to face when you are running facilities. Now, just, just to two extremes, 10% of women in West Bengal and Maharashtra live alone, whereas in Tamil Nadu it is 25. Next one. Poverty. I think uh, this is one of the biggest challenges this country has. I think this poverty rate is going up across the world. Particularly during this COVID time, the number of people going into poverty was on the rise. I remember we used to study in healthcare when we when we were part of Herit Apollo Hospital. I used to ready to read a lot of articles about the World Bank's report on healthcare, and report said poverty is one of the major causes for poverty is when people are falling sick, and people are falling sick they choose private facility. They choose private facility it becomes expensive, and therefore they get into pro. Uh, uh, in a poverty status. Now, in India, majority of the people who are living in poverty live in rural areas. Some of them are very happy with, you know, little food they get, but they may not get fully nourished. What they really require, they may not get, and that's the truth. So what really happens is very interesting to see here. The poverty level is more when the household size is more because Old people get relegated to nothing. When you look at, uh, you know, insurance schemes, when a family is insured under uh, uh, um, RSBY, RSBY does not, you know, families don't include the old person in the RSBY. They include the children and themselves, but not the old person. So, old people are relegated to nothing, even in families. I'm happy that the government of India has come out with some program, which I'll probably, you know, highlight uh, during the next presentation. Is that uh, national program for healthcare of the elderly has come? But understand, when the number of people are more in a family, it is low. Now I understand the household size is quite more in Uttar Pradesh. Probably it has six. While well, the country probably in Tamil Nadu it is four. So number of family size is also going down, and poverty and vulnerability are, you know, practically you know, related to each other in respect of rural living. I think majority of the people who are poor live in rural areas. I think in inaccessible places where there is no transportation, there is no health care, there are no services available to them. I think uh, probably somewhere across, I'm not sure whether I'm going to touch upon this, the Government of India's Ministry of Social Justice, NIST, National Institute of Social Defense, is asking the regional resource training centers to reach out to the PRS in a panchayat raj institutions to empower them on the care of the elderly. I think these programs are gradually taking on. And now, I think, again, Kerala has led the show beautifully with that, their Kudumbashri program, which panchayat raj programs are extraordinarily good in uh, Kerala. There is no comparable state in this country which can talk about care of the elderly better than, you know, Kerala, because they are reaching out. Even today, in the COVID situation, I was talking to Dr. Mr. Vijay Anand, who was a former chief secretary, was telling me that they have established 1,200 kitchens in various you know, villages. The food for the food to reach people, particularly migrants and old people and children. I think that is the effort that they commit themselves to ensure that disasters are very, very less. So now if you see the census, 71% of the senior citizens live in rural area. And uh, unfortunately, people like us, we're all concentrating only on our own area. I'm sitting in Hyderabad. I'm not setting up a facility in uh, local areas because it's not going to be affordable. It's not going to be easy for me to manage. Now, the problems that we have in you know, rural areas, you know, the PRI officials come, political influence come, political exertions are there. So we are all the time need to be careful about this. So poverty and vulnerability is another factor that's going to cause us worry. Can we go to the next one?
I need the statistics, please. Okay, now uh, I think uh, I hope uh, it improves, the presentation improves. Now coming to abuse. Understand, accept, you know, a small and insignificant number of people who choose facilities to move in. Either a old age home or a retirement community or whatever it is. Majority of them choose out of compulsion. They choose out of compulsion because they don't know how to cope with the family. Either they have trouble with the grandson or they have problem with the daughter-in-law or they have problem with the son-in-law or they have problem with somebody else in the family. I think if you know one could go through the newspapers on a daily basis, you will find a few days ago in Hyderabad, one old lady, the grandmother was murdered by a 17-year boy because she gave the property to three of her granddaughters. And he murdered her. 17-year-old boy murdered a grandmother at the age of 17, which I can't believe. At 17 years, he wanted the mother's grandmother's property. I think this is the level of abuse. Now understand the level of abuse is just not this. It's significant across. I remember in uh, you know about 10 years ago, we had uh, we have a you know helpline uh, 2339 000 in Hyderabad. We use it for a limited purpose. It was inaugurated by Mr. R.P. Singh, the commissioner of police those days. And something interesting happened. One of the old men got up and he lives in a very posh locality in uh, Hyderabad called Banjarais. And he called up and said, sir, I'm a 67-year-old person. I live in Banjarais. I have a neighbor who's a youth who's around uh, 32 years. Every time I go to the house, he lets his dog on me. It's a big dog. He lets his dog every time I go. Now, I'm dead scared about this. I, have, I can't run because I'm 67. I'm talking about 10 years ago. Please understand abuse of what nature? Abuse of what nature? You just can't believe a neighbor lets a dog, a young boy, lets a dog on a old person of 67 years. What for he does? You don't know. You don't know why he does it. So I think this is something that one needs to bear in mind. The percent, the share of number 60 plus is on the rise. If you see, this is a study again by the UNFPA team, which talks about abuse at certain person. I think the lot of lot of people, a lot of reports are coming about 60 percent, 70 percent of the people are abused. Please understand one thing: there are times abuse may not be intentional at all. It can be very, very unintentional. Now, uh, abuse can be in any form. If you define abuse, and I remember there is a lady called, uh, or quite a number of people who are familiar with the aging population would know, uh, Mrs. Sally Greengrass. Sally Greengrass is the one who started what is called Age Concern in UK, and she is appointed as a member of the parliament to the UK Lords. I meet her quite often when I go to London or to any other place. She used to tell me, abuse is what? When an old person is sitting and if you tap him and say hello, that's considered abuse. So I think we need to be very cautious about what how we define abuse, how to, where do we really go. I think abuse is on the increase. It could be of any type. It could be just a physical abuse. It could be abuse, calling the mother or the father an idiot or a stupid or a mother-in-law, you know, whatever it is. I think one has to bear this in mind. Can I go next, please? Now. I'm just giving you a lot of facts. The reason is, what will be the job of a social work administrator or a manager is something that you need to understand. When people are going to come to us, it is not like something like, you know, come with a fracture, x-ray is taken or a wife, you know, a CT scan is done or MRI correction is done, it goes back. No, I think the problem of aging is lifelong. I don't think anything can happen without, you know, a problem. So, just a minute. Yeah. Now, coming to substance abuse. Imagine 60 to 64 years, 77% of men and 45% of men, uh, women use alcohol, smoking. Imagine that. This is something very sad that people 
or using smoking and alcohol drinking is something which is very very high smoking is not so high but then these are the two major things that one minute okay now let me talk to mr dr james dr james prabhakar yes sir yes Yes, I don't know why they are not. Everybody is mentioning they are not able to see. No, they need to pin the you know your presentation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then it's okay. Then I can. Available. They need to pin it. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks. Okay. The next person says social isolation. Social isolation can mean committing suicide more than anything else. If people are not so aggressive, probably you know they are withdrawing. They live alone. They don't. now i think loneliness is something that it happens to a lot of people when uh, they don't have uh, networking relationships they they don't know whom to talk to i think i think it's few days ago i mentioned this in some meeting uh, i think it is in uh, one of the districts of uh, tamil nadu i think a muslim lady 103 years was treated for covid and she went back home and she has a daughter and a daughter a granddaughter the granddaughter was studying for 35 years they were asked to vacate the place the resident the warder of the landlord said you vacate the place we cannot allow you to continue to stay here what will they do is a big challenge is the government going to come to rescue who is going to come to rescue is a big challenge that you going to have in terms of social isolation let me give a nice uh, incident that uh, we encountered is a beautiful a very lovely incident isolation Mr. Naidu, B. B. Naidu, came to us in 1995 January. At that point of time, he was 91 years. Now, in 95, somebody on 91 was something that we are not able to believe that can be there, but he came. When came, I remember all the staff falling at his feet and taking his blessings. Now, this was 95 February. In '95, we celebrated the World Elders Day. We had about 2,000 people sitting in the Bharatiya Vijay Bhavan in Hyderabad, and we requested him to come and sit in the dais. So, on a request, he came and sat in the dais. And Ms. Dr. Bala Murali Krishna and Mrs. Kishori Amankar performed a jugal bandi that was sponsored by Dr. D's Laboratories. the newspapers after all the meeting was over they wanted to know why this gentleman was sitting on the dais why did he came then we introduced him to the audience and there were the first program that we had major media coverage and they asked the gentleman what is the success behind his 91 years i am talking about social isolation how this man le led beautifully a life where he is isolated alone he has no wife because he is 91 years He has a big story to tell you, but I want to tell you only four points that he had said. The story that he mentioned was: what is the reason behind his success? Was number one, he says, "I refuse to be seen in the midst of old people." The ninety-one-year man said, "I refuse to be seen in the midst of the old people." The second thing he said, "I always want to be in the midst of young girls." the third thing that he said that every time he felt sick he went to the doctor he came back and did exactly opposite to what the doctor told him to do and the fourth thing that he mentioned he said there's nothing called lunch and dinner for him the lunch and dinner is very simple he says every 2 hours i take a katori of some item either a fruit or a nut or you know something like that i will take every 2 hours my for a lunch for me is only once a sunday a full chicken he said one chicken every sunday is all my lunch otherwise there's nothing called lunch and dinner for me understand loneliness what he did i'm i'm not able to tell you because of lack of time but let me tell you you can write a book on what he has done to overcome his isolation fabulous unbelievable you can't believe that you can somebody can do that the next comes chronic illness disabilities bedridden conditions etc WHO has said 65 and above fall 
28 to 35% each year. Please understand this fall rate is very, very high. The proportion increases as the frailty level increases. The prevalence of falls in India, imagine it's, it's anything between 14% to 53%, depending on the age, depending on the region. Now, people come to you with fall related injuries and bedridden condition. My mother was one such example. She had a fall once when she was 84. Till 93, she had three falls. We performed three, two surgeries. Third surgery failed because the bone became very, you know, bitter, a very, you know, uh, it was osteoporotic condition. It became very brittle, so they couldn't do the third surgery. So that is the third thing that happens. So people are going to come to us and to the facilities with conditions. I have seen in one of those old age homes that I visit, you know, in particular in Tamil Nadu and Telangana, when you visit old age homes, there are a lot of people who are not able to move. They walk with four of their, you know, both their legs and hands. And they move everywhere like that. And I always admire old age homes which are able to take care of such people because it's not easy to take care of them, provide them care. I think uh, that is a big challenge that we are going to have in the years to come. Then comes mental health problems. Depression is one of the biggest things that happens. Unfortunately, depression is hardly detected, never diagnosed. The second thing that happens is dementia. Dementia is being discussed in this country in a big way. If you are talking about mental disorder, you can see 15% of adults aged 60 and above suffer from mental disorder. 15% is a real huge number. 15% of mental disorder. So I have to now think myself, what is it I am now suffering from? And in the case of Alzheimer's, that is dementia, 4% in India are, are expected to be suffering from dementia. Understand, India, we don't have much statistics because the studies have not been done. Way back in 30 years ago, Dr. Martin Prince from UK did some study. I think we are relying only on the study that he did 25, 30 years ago. There's not enough number of studies to be there, but there could be some studies which are done by small organizations only for their benefit. But the fact remains, this disorder is on the rise because in our facilities, we will have at least about 30 to 35 people with the memory loss. So caring for them is a very, very big challenge. The families are the people who go through a lot of pain in this service. Next one. Now I'm coming to what is it we are learning out of all this. I think it's a service that we are rendering. The service that we are rendering is even if you charge, even if you charge exorbitantly, you can, it's something that you cannot believe that services of that nature. I always go before anybody who's able to service old people in the manner which they're serving. Except I'm not bothered about people. I'm not worried about people who are abusing them. I think majority of them, 95% of them really provide a lot of care because that's a purpose for them. So I think first principle that I want to you know, emphasize to myself and to all of you is the understanding of the psychological, social, emotional, financial challenges old people face must always be in the heart of social geront uh, gerontology social workers. It's very important. If you are not able to understand this, you will not be able to resolve anything. You are not going to be helpful to the people at all. The second thing is gerontological social work has a potential to roll or assist and guide the growing number of old people. It is important for social workers to carefully assess their independence level. Please understand. <laughs> However sick a person may be, they still want to be independent. I remember I've seen one of the doctors in Bangalore. His mother-in-law was uh, 78 years blind. She would walk all by herself. Occasionally, she will ask for assistance. If either the daughter goes, the daughter was, was over 60 years goes, or the son-in-law goes, or grandchildren go, she says, no, I don't, I want to do it myself. Independent need is something that you and me cannot get angry about. When the person says, I want to be independent, we get irritated. Why are you not taking assistance? But please understand that independence level gives them a lot of mental satisfaction. I think the self-esteem is something that they come in when they are able to be independently doing something, even little they are doing, they feel very good about it. I think the same thing happens to the kids. Kids want to eat themselves, but we want to feed them. If the child feels independent when he or she eats the food himself or herself using the spoon. 
I think that is something that we need to respect. Family grievers, I think this is one of the new, you know, uh, aspects that is developing in this country. I think family caregivers. I think at this point of time, very little attention is paid to this aspect of the society. Family caregivers burn out. Understand how long will they care? How, uh, how long will they care for? How long will they care for a person who is sick? Will they not get exhausted? So the question is, what are you going to do about them? Is an important aspect of management and administration the social workers need to focus on. The next is very important. Enhance community-based services. I think it is something that we need to really talk. Community services should really improve. That's something that we need to. And when you are following those four principles that I mentioned to you, please remember always one major thing. Senior citizens are assets of this country. We are all trying to relegate them as nobody. Please remember, senior citizens are the national assets. I am extremely grateful to the government of India for mentioning this in the National Policy 1999 document. Very clearly states they are the national assets. Now, it is just not enough to say they are national assets. You must also do you know, aspects that would give them the dignity to be respectful. I think I personally feel the respect for senior citizens starts at home. And then when it starts at home, I think you are able to take it to the communities. I think that is very important for us to remember that. Let's prepare them. And I'm just very, very briefly mentioned about social workers and social work administration. I think uh, it's a hands on job versus policy. I don't want to really talk too much of this. But I want to mention in this whole aspect of learning too is that this is a job where one has to be available 24 hours. It's like a hospital job. Managing senior citizens required 24 hours care. Now, social workers should mentally get set. Yes, I'm going to spend this time. It's available, it's reported for me. Now, when you're talking about I run a facility for a company. I run a, I run a foundation for you know, advocacy. Now, I have two different accounting systems. One is a for-profit center where I'm talking about taxation, income tax payment. I'm talking about a foundation where there is no you know, corporate tax, where I get ATG exemptions, and therefore my accounting procedures are different. I think the social work administration has a lot to do with that. Understand one thing, social work job is always hands-on. It is not about writing papers. It is all about hands-on jobs where I go, interact, relate to the individual and the families and the communities. You know, the social group work that beautifully Dr. Rajan mentioned, Dr. Rajan mentioned. I think that is something that we need to manage. You are going to talk to them on a case-to-case -case basis, which, you know, Dr. Suman beautifully mentioned on a case-to-case -case basis. But the social work administration is talking about overall management. How do all these social case workers perform? How do all the social group workers perform? How, are, how is the community working? We are looking at this. How do we relate to the government of India's policy making? How do we relate to the respective state government's policy making? Where, where, do, they, where do we relate? I think these are all the jobs of a social uh, administration. Next one. Two, three. I'm talking about community services. Now, support patient advocate. I'm talking about health career. It's, it's just too nice to know when you're talking about the elderly, there are three, that could be more, but for me, there are three important aspects of age care. First is the income care, the old age income. I think income security is so important. The second aspect is health care. Once you have good health, Incomes becomes easy to gain. When you don't have income, then you can't maintain good health. I think both are very, very important. And the third aspect is what is called care. The care given by the families, the care the community renders. So the three important aspects, one will have to all the time remembering wherever the professional works, either as a social worker or as an administrator of a social work institution, namely a retirement community or a old age home or a you know daycare center or whatever it is. Understand these three are important aspects of it. 
Income security, health security, care security. Now, when you are talking about healthcare, you know, I remember in one of those meetings of the WHO in Thailand, in Bangkok, somebody from India mentioned India talks about national program, national program for healthcare of the elderly without doing anything. They have not established anything, but they are talking about it. But let us understand one thing. Some of you are, in, you know, in Tamil Nadu know. Forget about the effectiveness of it, but there are geriatric centers opened by the government of Telangana has opened it. Tamil Nadu has opened it. I have visited them. I have invited the, you know, the regional uh, the doctors from the place. I remember Dr. Lavina from Kaimutur, uh, Social Work Department of Bharatiya Bharati University, invited those people to come and talk to all the trainees. I think enough start. It's going to take a long time in India for these kind of things to take a shape. But I can tell you, we have started doing very well in Hyderabad, very close, 100 kilometers away. There's a beautiful program where 10 beds have been allotted and the Tata Trust is supporting them. Helpage India is also putting their staff across and we give them a lot of training programs. I think specialization of national program healthcare is one area where the social work administrator has a lot of role to play, you know, linking them with uh, you know care. The next is intake assessments. I think it's very important. Sometimes we look at today what is happening. Anybody who wants an entry into any facility in a old age home or the poor or the rich, first thing they ask you, what is your health status? Have you done a COVID test? When was your COVID test done? What's your family? Who, which neighborhood are you coming from? Which community you are talking from? Which doctor you are coming from? It's all becoming a big, big, what's called fear psychosis. All of us are absolutely scared. So same thing, normal circumstances. Intake assessments are very, very important for maintaining a person in home. I want to know what is the family that he comes from. I remember one, we had one Mr. Rao. He had underwent the knee surgery in Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. Unfortunately, in his case, the surgery failed. He couldn't walk. So he belongs to a very affluent family. So he got admitted in our hospital heritage medical center. He was such, he was such an irritated person, such an angry person. He will keep on pressing the call bell. He will not allow the nurses to do any other care except look after himself. He will keep on pressing every second. The nurse will go give something and come. Once again, he will press. Please understand, if you are you are not understood the person carefully, you are only going to get angry. You are only going to get irritated. You are not going to give them proper service. We have to understand as social workers, as social work care managers, our job is to be patient, empathetic, devoted, Compassionate, all the words that come in are, have a lot of importance to do when you're talking about care management. Next comes coordinate with the doctors, physiotherapist, dietitians, nursing professionals, and others. Now I'm seeing in a lot of old age homes which are funded by the Ministry of Social Justice, Government of India through the state governments or through, you know, as an original resource center, when we visit them, we are able to meet the doctors, we are able to see the physiotherapists, we are able to see the nursing nurses who are working there. Dietitians are not part of the team, but these three people are very important. For dietitians are very important in a, in a facility which are expensive, where people are paying for services. Understand that the question is social work administrator, the role it could be very different in two different settings, one for not profit, two for profit, two for third for orphanages. How do you really do that? They may not be able to afford it. Please understand. There are nutritionists available to come and offer free services on a voluntary basis. The question is capacity of the you know, manager to get this coordination back. Next comes establish an accurate perspective of the medical and psychological state of each person seeking assistance or residence in case of institutions. What kind of a what kind of a care you are doing? But I always tell in our experience of 26 years of time, even if they come for health care. You know, something that I always bear in mind, I always educate my staff is when a person is, old person is coming to your institution for care, what you can resolve through medical attention has very little to do more than the personal attention that you give. It is more to do with the care than cure. I think more of caring is required than cure because then some of the diseases are not going to come, but some of them are permanent. When I can't walk properly in my knee, the doctor says, Gangadharan, you're getting old. So there's nothing you can do. So you adapt your changing lifestyles. I have a back problem. 
Okay, your back problem is what has not happened today. It's happened 10 years ago. So there's nothing to change your lifestyle. So that's the second thing that I would say. Now, I'm having a lot of disorders in stomach. What do I do, doctor? I'm not able to eat. Well, okay, now. Now, we are not going to discount everything to say that old people cannot be cured. But the question is, there are diseases which actually cannot be, much can be done. You need to adapt yourself lifestyles. It's very important. I think this is something a lot to do with the social workers, being counseling experts, spending a lot of time, rapport building. They can do a lot in doing this. Then finally, a lot of patients don't know what to do. Even today, I'm, I'm sure some of you are listening to me from various old age homes in Tamil Nadu and Telangana, particularly, you know, all of you know that some of them don't get pension. So you submit their application. You help them submit their application. Better you send a person. When a doctor is uh, along with them to the doctor. I think this is something that you are doing so beautifully. And this will have to be done across everywhere. How do you coordinate them? How do you take, how do you motivate such people is another thing that you need to do. Can we go to learning four? Evolving roles of family caregivers. I think I mentioned to you earlier, I want to definitely touch on this. It is the families that have all along provided all the emotional care, physical care, and all kinds of cares. And it was when the person, of old person comes, whether it's parents or grandparents or any other family members, and they don't have capacity to function independently, the family members provided the care. But I think I've already mentioned to you, nuclearization has slowly eroded family care. And we are moving into a care where families may not be available to care for them anymore, as has happened in the case of people who have migrated outside the country or outside of their villages. Families are not available. So it is something that we have to understand but very important, wherever family care is available, I think we should sustain that caring system. We need to ensure that the families are supported. And therefore, we should have separate programs for them so that they don't get burnt out. They are going to get burnt out day in and day. Families are supported. And therefore, we should have separate programs for them so that they don't get burnt out. They are going to get burnt out day in and day out. So therefore, we should help them cope with the burnout. I think that's something that we need to do. Now, caregiving role expands with the increasing frailty, dementia, Parkinson's disease, or advanced cancer because the disease, when it prolongs, one is a recovery, other one non-recovery. Some diseases cannot be recovered, they cannot be cured. So therefore, they are going to get into you know, their debilitating conditions. How do you really do that? Families really get stressed. And 90% of the cases, it is the women, not 90%, perhaps 95% of the cases, it's women, be it a daughter, daughter-in-law, granddaughter, or any, any relative. But 90% of the time, it's women who are under stress. And women, even if they are going for work, they're still stressed. I think today we are all seeing them. The women folk cannot go to offices because they're all part of the, you know, what is called computer learning. They're, they're asked to sit back to help the children learn computers so they cannot go to the office or they're going to the office, they keep coming and going. The stress levels are very, very high. So I think we need to really do something very seriously at the national level, training and education of family members who wish to become health, health caregivers for the client. It's not for money, as a volunteer. I think Indonesia has done an extensive work on this. They've been very successful. I think it's moved on to Vietnam. Old people are being trained to care for their you know, relatives or for the friend's neighborhood. I think that's something that's very important for the social caseworker or the social work manager to understand. And understand ADL, which I mentioned to you, activities of daily living. Can you change their clothes? Can you give them a bath? Can you give them a sponge bath? If they you know, have to attend to the natural, natural, uh, nature calls, will we be able to assist them? I think probably this kind of a training will be very useful to the family. Next one, learning five. Social work, administration, and management. Administration is concerned more with the determination of organizational policies. I think this is more, for me, it's more a, you know, a, a, more a theoretical perspective of understanding. It talks about determination of organizational policies, coordination of finances, service provision, and setting the direction of the organization. When we run this program, the, the, when we're running the program, I think I can only tell you 
I don't think whether it's an affluent class of society or a poor class of society or run for a profit or not for a profit, the problems faced by the care homes are same. It is all same. The concerns are same. Food is not good. There's no salt in that. It's very chilly. It's very watery. There is no taste in that. This is a normal problem that you have. I went to I have my bath. There was no water there. Tap is not working. Tap is leaking. I, I don't have a toothpaste to clean my teeth in the morning. I don't have a soap to have my bath. These are all the normal things that happens. I think this is something that you have to train people to be, you know, receptive to this kind of, uh, you know, criticisms. Next one. I think, no, the reason I'm giving this before I really define the roles is to understand all of us need to understand what is the role of an administrator. What is the role of a staff there? The staff may not have on fingertips all the policies and programs of the country and specific to the states, what are very relevant to the states. People with the interest will do it. But please understand the social work administrator in a facility has to be very, very familiar with it. For example, if it is a old age home and particularly in the, you know, funded by the government, I think we always advise every old age home to ensure that every resident in their home get a national old age pension scheme, what is called Indira Gandhi old age pension scheme. We ask, always ask them how many of them are having old age pension. If they don't have, what is being done? Even if it takes two to three, four years of time because of variety of limitations, can we include them? I think this is something that I'm very happy. You know, a lot of old age homes are taking it up with us, you know, collectorate and pushing, and quite a number of them say that we have so many people who are receiving old age home, uh, old age pension. Some of them say that we are pushing the papers. It's taking time. Can you help us? I think this is something that old age, please understand, income security is so important. It's a lot of self-esteem for a person to think that I'm getting 100 rupees in my pocket. It's very important. Two, national policy on older persons, 1999. It's more than 20 years old. I think that it's being reviewed. It's being reviewed. It's being reviewed once again. In whatever shape it takes, there is a policy. I think one should be very familiar with the policy. One is the, we are saying that national policy is not adequately covering. The other one is we should be covering more. But the other side of it is that how much can you rely on the national policy on older persons to benefit and ensure, uh, benefit the older people and also improving their quality of life. Third, Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act 2007. Please understand, this kind of legislation is available in many other countries as well. Maybe not called the same way, but the legislation to protect the senior citizens. In this country, I think this has been passed in 2007, and uh, it has good provisions. I mean, any, any act in this country needs improvement. All over the world, it needs upgrading. But the fact reminds, it covers, by and large, a lot of schemes. I mean, uh, ensuring at least, I'm sure all of us read a lot of, uh, you know, newspaper articles, it talks about negative, uh, you know, implications of the old persons. I remember very, very, I will never remember, forget to remember this case. This has happened about 25 years ago in Mumbai. The old lady, uh, a couple, old couple, fell from that, maybe I'm wrong in the floors, that fell from one of the top terrace buildings, committed suicide. And they left a note with somebody saying that they are committing suicide because a son and daughter-in-law wanted their property to be turned uh, written on their name. And they said after our death, it should not be given to them. Understand, this kind of abuse in the families are the one, and many of them like this, has resulted in the formulation of this scheme, uh, the Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act. Understand one thing, it's taken a is taking a good shape, and I'm sure over a period of time it will take better shape because it's also being reviewed. I think it's also coming in as a Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens uh, Act 2020 now, amended act. Hopefully, it will be passed this year by the parliament when it meets and it will be good, but it's something existing. National Program for Healthcare of the Elderly is a very interesting scheme because it's operational in a lot of places. A lot of people are getting benefited. The next is Integrated Program for Welfare of the Senior Citizens. This has just been updated a few weeks ago in my government of India. It was started in 1992. Now it is uh, 2020. And 2020, the schemes are available for ensuring quality of life of 
poor old people understand this particular program is meant for poor people poor old people and very good schemes are there very nice programs are there old age homes are being somewhat supported for 25 residents 50 residents older women and demand people with alzheimer's care i think multi service centers and a variety of programs very recently the government of india also had added national action plan for senior citizens 20 they are able to beautifully integrate both integrated uh, program for welfare of senior citizens offered by the government of india and part of the national action plan being delegated to the state governments a very interesting program and i'm very sure uh, those people who are really interested can benefit uh, senior citizens through their initiatives and i really welcome this to be done you'll be very happy to support in whatever way we could do that i think this is one role that uh, social welfare managers need to understand then comes to assistive devices which i really don't want to dis- talk which being distributed across the country the role of regional resource training centers are very important because they are uh, what is called uh, they are building capacities of the ngos funded by the government of india and in the process also supporting the ngos funded by the state governments i think tamil nadu and kerala has a lot of old age homes and uh, programs supported by the state government so these two states have in particular a lot of programs and number of old age homes perhaps in tamil nadu Till at this point of time, not less than 120 to 130, including including integrated old age homes. I think the role of social workers there and the role of social gerontologists there could be very very significant once they learn. Helplines, helplines are being established across uh, in various uh, countries. Uh, sorry, various states, and I'm very sure it's very helpful in a way when it's properly coordinated well. And then concession for travel. Please understand, old people want concessions. concessions are privileges just not concession they are privileges they think i must go to a park i am 70 years old can i get a concession of 50% can i get a free entry if you go to london when a person reaches 65 years of age on the very day when he reaches 65 years everything is available to him free including the entire tube railways everything is free for them i think the entitlement months are something that poor people are really looking forward to their supposed to then comes to learning number 7 i'm talking about gerontology professionals working closely with older person the families health care and other organizations care to i think i already mentioned this understand how people age please understand people age differently people age differently as they grow older people age differently because they are from a different family background from a different educational background literacy is different the family circumstances are different health conditions are different the second thing comes in when i am 60 i am different when i am 65 i am different when i am 70 i change at 75 i change further we need to understand how the age and it has to be on a one on one basis it has to be unique it is indiv- each individual is unique a social case worker or a social manager social care manager will have to appreciate the fact don't treat them in crowd i remember some of the old age homes that i visit they say they don't have fixed time for old age homes to have food he says that food is available between 12 to 2 it's available between 7:30 to 8:30 it's available between 4 to 5 they have given that one hour leverage or two hour leverage so that you know whenever they feel like eating they can go i think that is something that we need to understand respect next old age homes are the places uh, day care centers are the places where world over abuses have taken place there are cases outside india particularly in london and european countries where lethal injections have been given to the residents of the resi- of the nursing homes because they were called they were not letting this nurses sleep in the night time so they were all given injections and killed i think that is the level of impatience i think this is one area where social gerontology professionals at the lower level or higher level play a dominant role in you know how do you inspire people to work then comes second career i think days have gone when you are talking about 60 as a retirement at 60 nobody is old everybody is young i think old age in india is also changing it's also not any more 60 so people are very active at the age of 75 i i really want to mention the name of the person mr mitchell i'm sure some of you i don't know whether he is joined i have not sent him an invitation mr mitchell is a 93 year old i think he has been a very very active uh, association member was the president of the all india senior citizens confederation even today at 93 he said let me work for the elderly and he takes up the cause 
I think some of you may know there is one Dr. Vyasa Murthy who runs Yahoo groups. He's probably 75 years. He has been active in this field for 10 years. He's keeping himself very busy. Please understand, second career does not mean money. Second career means physical activity, mental activity, being useful to the society. I think these are all the areas, even if you are going to be running a old age home, within the old age homes, I must mention here, Mr. Ramachandran passed away last week in Kanya Kumari. Mr. Uh, you know, Jane was running it. I remember to have met uh, uh, you know, a farmer who was staying in a resident, resident uh, what is called our old age home. He showed a lot of interest in agriculture and he was an agriculturist. Let me tell you that power old age home today has a lot of you know, greenery. I think second career does not mean economics. Second career means physical activity, mental activity, being productive, being active, maintaining good health and also serving the society and the community. I think this is something that the uh, you know, manager has to really look on to it. Then promote lifelong learning. You know, promote lifelong learning. How do you do that? Okay, there are, you know, Western countries have what is called third age school of learning. I don't want to talk about it, but in India, what we did was we started doing computer training in 1999. We started doing computer training for people who were 60. And I can tell you, we trained a little over 5,000 people in a less than two years' time. Huge number of people underwent training. They're all using now email, they're using PowerPoint presentation. And today they all have become very skilled. I think making them learn continuously is very important. Next, what are the skills required to be a manager? Leadership, leading a group of people. Please understand it's like an orchestra. When we, I think when we look at A.R. Raghaman's music, you see he is playing a music, but there is a master who is showing all the you know, signals to people what song, where it goes. I think it's an orchestra. Leadership is an orchestra where he leads. I think it's very important that the team can always de get demotivated when there is an abuse, report of abuse. I think that is something that we need to do. Team building. Team building is not about talking about every staff of mine will have strengths. Please understand, every staff of mine will have strengths and weaknesses. Nobody is perfect. Never. So you need to know how to use their weaknesses, how to use their strengths, and that's the leadership. I think with the People are going to come and then, sir, he's doing this, she's doing this, she's doing that, she's going doing that. These are all daily, what is called gossip mongering that takes place in organization. But a leader knows how to use even that gossip mongering, how to use it effectively without affecting the person. Team building is one of the important aspects. Creating a positive culture develops a sense of belonging. I remember, um, you know, when I joined Apollo Hospital, you know, the most fascinating person I've ever come across is Dr. Pratap Reddy. On the day he joined something, he told me, from today, I will not get signing any paper, Gandharan, you will sign the paper. I want you to do only one thing for me. Invite the spirit of Apollo family culture in every one of us. Please invite the spirit of Apollo family culture in every one of us. I think this is the spirit. That is the inspirational words that I always remember even today. I think that is the spirit with which it works. Conflict resolution, please understand, conflicts always arise. I think conflicts occur every day in every organization. It happens because different kinds of people come in. There is a person who says, I know everything. There is another person who says, you do whatever you want, I'm indifferent. There is another person who says, you tell me, I will do. Another person who says, you don't tell me, I don't do. So. These are all the kinds of people who are working in your team. And you need to understand them individually and use them individually, the team's spirit, without sustaining, without compromising on team spirit, you need to use them so well. I think it's not difficult. The question is, you need to spend, I think the manager has to spend time, the administrator has to spend time there. You know, the supervisor has to spend time. Understand behavior of a person changes. I remember when I was in school, there was, uh, you know, I, I, I probably eighth standard. Students used to, my classmates used to tell me, hey, this man has had a haircut today, so he's going to be very rude. So what happened psychologically, all of us thought every time he's coming for a haircut once a month, on that day, everyone will behave themselves well so that he's not rude. I think the understanding one's behavior is very important. It's not a criticism. Understanding and behaving ourselves. So since we knew the teacher was going to be bad on that day, so all of us were very well-being. 
I think this is something that we need to understand. It is not about punishments all the time. It is also not talking about ignorance. It's balancing between the two. There are times you will ignore. There are times you will pull up. There are times you will be abusive. There are times you will punish. There are times you will, you know, exonerate. I think all these things will have to go together. Then comes interpersonal relations, sharing experience, setting common goals. I think very important. All of us know in our facility that we don't want any complaints coming from any residents and the families about the care. I think it's very simple goal set. I don't think we need to have studies. You don't need to have, you know, reports. Yeah, the academic research can go on. But as far as the programs are concerned, I don't think we want to really study the numbers. We just want to tell, I must be ensuring that on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't complain. I don't have complaints. I think that's just the yardstick which I work. Motivation. Developing potential challenges teams to improve service. Appreciate, acknowledge. Please understand, very important thing in management is appreciation. And develop the potential. I don't know what is my potential. It is possible that you give me half a dozen chances to do different, different things. And you find me useful there or I find myself productive there. And I think I develop the potential. I think potential is one that you need to try people in different subjects and then see where it is. Because I've got the basic qualities. Not that I don't have. The question is how do you harness it? I think it is very important for us to understand and appreciate. It's very important. Then comes communication. Develop open-mindedness. I think communications, all of us are prejudices. I think I remember, uh, you know, some of your uh, past speakers, our past speakers have mentioned about prejudices. We carry impressions. Old people are like this and ladies are like this. Women are like this. Boys are like this. Girls are like this. Please understand. This kind of, you know, giving them a brand is very, very wrong. It is wrong. We need to be open all the time. Sometimes you may not. For some reason, that's different. But basically, we must be in a position to listen to others' point of view. Prevent jealousy. I think when you are appreciating somebody in public, I think jealousy comes in among the staff. That is something that you need to balance if you are having a proper team building skills and leadership skills. And understand backbiting is one of the worst skills that you can always encourage. Never, ever encourage somebody who is backbiting. And coming to skills needed for social work administrator, Developing budgets, I think, let us understand one thing, today everything is money. Tomorrow everything will be money. Money is something that you need to go all, all the time. I cannot overspend. Tomorrow something goes out of order and let's say air condition is uh, burnt. I'm going to spend 10,000 rupees. I don't have a budget for it. My, you know, power wiring has completely gone. I have to spend 25,000 rupees. I don't have a budget. I think it is something very important for both Expensive facility, non-expensive facility to keep the budgets in mind very, very particular. They need to always monitor that. I think all of us are taught in administration and in practice keeping track of budgets. Then two, understand the age, gender perspectives. Please understand different age groups comes with different, uh, you know, what is called backlog. They come with, you know, tag along. What is that they are coming with? What is the gender they are coming with? There are times, I remember we are faced in our senior citizen associations. What do they say? Oh, they're all North Indians. They sing uh, Hindi songs. We are all South Indians. We want to sing Tamil songs. This is going to happen in a group. It's a heterogeneous group. How do you promote it? I think how do you balance it is something that we need to all the time bear in mind. Development of programs. I think we, all the time we have to keep developing new programs. We have to look at the review of the programs. How do you really do that? Next, evaluating the efficacy of existing programs. Understand one thing. We are all going to fail when we don't introspect of what we are doing. We will all fail when we don't evaluate our, where our programs are going. I don't think you need an external agency to see what your programs are. You know yourself. Because the feedback that you're getting is from your own residents and also from the families. Or from the family. I, when I go to old age homes in Tamil Nadu and Telangana, I can tell you. Majority of the people I ask, they're all very happy. They're telling the people are looking after us so well. There's nothing for us to really look back. We cannot get anything more. I think. This is, the facial expressions are so good, you need to understand where you stand. Now, after I go, they may probably tell, vegetable was not good, results are not good, I could be probably served in a better plate than this. Please understand, evaluate your own self. Evaluation is very, very important. And then comes, there are times when you don't have the capacity, skills to do it. How do you identify the skills? Put your own skills. Identify outsiders to come and help you. 
in the case of voluntary sector a lot of a lot of volunteers will come and help you of, of course the timing is there is but you need to help them be there you need to you know and work with them to get them to the time that they should start have them with you then i don't want to talk about the policies and regulations were essential part of running an organization then comes outreach activities are very important i think i think mrs neera i remember to when she mentioned about community outreach i think government of india is supporting um, uh, you know mobile medicare units reaching out to societies it's a good example you have a daycare center where the communities reach you know is very good then you have you know respite care centers that's a very good reach out so i have this kind of facility I have some programs depending on what your objectives are and fine tuning delivery program fine tuning delivery program is what i mentioned out of uh, you know out of uh, what is called feedback once you have that next coming to the next point i think i'm looking at the time 1252 okay stay understand leadership is very important you have to be necessarily an inspiring leader an inspiring leader is a one who has knowledge style you know when you look at the style of rajinikanth for example i think the biggest jokes go around with uh, rajinikanth not as much about uh, amitabh bachchan he has a style i think people like a lot of people like his style that style of leadership is very important you know i must tell you an example all of you know ford cars so when ford was asked this is about 60 70 years ago when henry ford was asked what is the big take away for management of an organization and he said beautifully you know what he said take away my building take away my property take away everything give me my people leave my people alone i'll recreate another ford i think that is the spirit of an organization the spirit of organization is the style and the commitment i have it is so important it is very important for you to understand that style is very important. you must have a style then coat another example dr pratap reddy when he comes in the car in the morning time to apollo chennai when he comes out of the car and he finds somebody is very sick and getting out of the car you know what he will do he will immediately open the car and get a wheelchair he will not wait for the watchman or a housekeeping boy or a, you know ward boy to come but he will do it himself that is a style when i see this i'm going to do it i'm going on a you know corridor in hospital i find some trash thrown let's say paper i don't ask for housekeeper to come i pick up the trash and put it in my pocket to throw it in the dustbin i think that's a you know style that you need to adopt boldness to challenge status quo i will not be what it is i will go to the hospital everybody gives me a big salute no i'm telling no i don't want you to give me a salute give the salute to the person who is a patient who is your vip not me i think this is something that style skill always positive please understand skill of a leader is always looking at positive friendliness respect indulging go go get it you know i will get i will not hesitate what i want to do that's a skill that i have come on my let's do it it's wonderful that we do it i think there is something that we need to do then goes to product design and development i think we're all talking about what is a product design and development in senior care it's very interesting you know you know i go to some of the old age and i find very interesting uh, observations i have seen some old age homes where all the dining tables are stainless steel topped which means understand cleanliness is so easy and the appearance is so elegant it's a beautiful product design i'm talking about it then two development now yesterday i was giving them a medicine by the side of the box but today i keep the medicine according to the time i have i buy medicine box which has morning afternoon night and you know afternoon and evening whatever it is i buy the medicines keep it there product get them so you are making it safe for the staff to work that's the third thing let me tell you human resources i've already told about food human resources understand one thing i will give another example of human resource what human resource can do i was when i was working for apollo hospital chennai you know wonderful inter- inter- very interesting experience we had you know our initially when apollo was started you know this is you know when mg ramachandran was admitted thereafter the uh, second floor had uh, what is called uh, uh, the first floor had sorry the first floor had a dialysis unit the ground floor had uh, the basement had housekeeping now office keys all the room keys and second floor in the night time we had the what is called a satellite housekeeping office when patients 
from dialysis room are taken to the wards, the patients will be, you know, in a, wheel, in a stretcher will be kept on a corridor and they will go and search for a key to come. It takes about 10 minutes. The dialysis patient used to get very irritated. And for one year, we couldn't find a solution. Let me tell you, we had ward, office, ward boys meeting. And I still remember the boy, Ravi. Ravi caught up and said, sir, in future, we will not shift the pit. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So what happened? That person said in future we won't shift the patient, but we'll take the key first and then we'll shift. Very human resource, that's a potential. Please understand there is no education in this common sense. You must always respect the human beings which has that skill. You know, the thinking capacity is so huge, you must know how to use it. Quality management. Please understand, we are all not going to survive unless the quality. We are all talking about Air India having 50,000 rupees crore borrowing because of the poor quality of management. Whereas you are now talking about, you know, Indigo. Everybody buys the tickets in Indigo because it's on time more than the money. We are all wanting quality. We are all wanting well-behaved girl, well-behaved air staff. You know, everything is perfect. I think we are all looking quality, whether it is a old age home or anything. Perfect. Quality management is the one you are talking about. Everything goes as per the time schedule. Everything goes well. There is no compromise. Nobody says, you are, I am after all giving you free food. No. It's not that way. That is something that we need to always bear in mind. Marketing management. When you are talking about, example, self elder, uh, elderly self-help groups is a good example that you can take. It's a beautiful scheme. You have to market this. Everybody should be aware of it. Use of the term marketing does not mean selling. Selling it means promoting it. So we want elderly self-help groups to come across the country. How do you really do that? I think that's what I'm talking about. Then comes qualities needed. Social policy. I think I've already touched upon social policy, human behavior and psychology. I'm very, very sure, uh, hopefully, with the you know, Bharti Thasan University Heritage Center for Gerontology, when a one-year diploma comes in, we will be covering all these aspects of management. We hope uh, a lot of you, a lot of your friends, study this uh, you know, uh, gerontology and understand how we can be useful to the community. Now, you have to you know, delegate. Delegate is very important. Please understand, everyone cannot be doing everything. Sorry, one person cannot do everything, nor everyone can do everything. Understand the principle of management is unity of command. There should be one person to de give delegation. That is the manager. We are talking about administrator who delegates the power at the level because he cannot do every job. He or she cannot do all the jobs. So delegate. Now, when you are delegating, you need to be very careful about choosing the right person to delegate, not just a position around. Sometimes the position may be good, but a person delivering may not be good and you know, getting things done. So you need to bear that in your mind. Delegate to the right persons. That will be based on the earlier point that I mentioned. Potentials and talents have to be assessed. Based on that, you delegate. Understand something very important. Handliness for fulfillment of duty is extremely key. You know, it's like a simple principle. When, when, the, when justice is delayed, it is denied. It's assumed denied. Same thing when assigning responsibility. You must ensure before you go this evening, do this and go, report to me and go. Four o'clock, this has to be done. Report to me and go this time. One o'clock, 11.30, so our session starts. 11.25, all of you, 11.15, all of you report. 11.25, the, the first discussion will take place. 11.30, the program. I think this is something that we need to always bear in mind because people will respect our timeliness. Extend support needed to people. Prefer. I think it's very important as a quality Understand, it's not enough to recruit a person and saying they're not good. No. Please understand, every human being born in this world has a quality. They have the potential. Respect it. Don't look for that. It is there. Use them and you'll find it. Don't, deny, don't just deny somebody saying, I don't want it. Don't be impatient. Next, budget. I think already told you, let me not go there. Then you must understand where the programs are needed. That's very important. You cannot do the program everywhere, whatever you want to do. You must do what is called assessment. You need to decide which person, where it's needed. You run a daycare center, where will you run a daycare center? How can people reach? 
Are you going to have a vehicle to pick up? Is there a public transport available? Or is it a walking distance? If it's a walking distance, what's your distance one can walk? You can't make people walk 10 kilometers. I remember to have gone to one of those wonderful old age homes in Jammu. I was astonished to find there were 100 people. I think it is still, if I go to that Google, it, my picture is still there in Google among all old people. I picked up a picture and put it. And Mr. Dandotra, who organized this week for me in Jammu, I mean in Jammu, I remember, people were coming five kilometers. They were all coming. They will bring their food. They won't expect the daycare center to drive. They will come with their food. It is very important where it is needed. People want this. How do that? Then established task. You know, sometimes task force is very important. There are times when you may not be able to do all the jobs. You may establish. For example, we conduct an international day of older persons. You need a task force to do the program because at the end of the task force program is over. The task force is gone. So you know. You know, you need to have this kind of committees established. You need to identify where all the people who will do what jobs. Very important next is laws, bylaws. I think one is your own bylaws. Second is the government regulations. I think we have to understand, we have to conform to the laws. But yet I've already told, documentation is another important thing that we do. When you are talking money from the government of India, government of state, government of uh, various state government, they will ask you for giving all the documents because they don't want any fudge document. They want proper documents. Remember that it's very important. And review, and I think I've already told you review. Go to the next one. Well, now, responsibilities of administrators on a daily basis. Meet day to day. Please understand, meet day to day. Tomorrow is never. The mistake that has happened today, nip it at the bud. When it happens, nip it. Don't allow it to grow and then what has happened, what we are all talking in the newspapers, what we are hearing in the newspaper, Chinese came in and then we responded. We should have probably stopped them coming is what newspaper thing. Not my opinion, what I'm reading. Understand, you should not allow it to grow, stop it. You should not allow that to grow at all. You should nip it at the bud. I think very important on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very important for us to understand. Now, I have 25 residents in my old age home. Each one is this way. Now, shift-wise, I'm going to ask what happened between 8 to 8 last night, tell me what happened. Well, this person had vomiting. This person was having fever. I gave this medicine to this person. I think this is very, very important for you, not only to control, but also to engage in the staff. Please understand, staff should not be allowed to gossip. I think gossiping is a disaster for management. You should not allow people to gossip. You should keep them engaged, keep them busy. If you don't have any work, please ensure you give them a book to read. Let them write, let them read a novel, but don't allow them to gossip. The gossiping is a disaster. It is as virus as corona is. Very important you have to bear this in mind. Meet the staff, right? Policies, always keep reviewing at the month end, weekend, budget reviews. Have your implementation. Are you sticking to policies? Government has asked you to do PFMS. Am I doing a PFMS? What difficulties I have? I'm supposed to maintain a separate account. Do I maintain a separate account? I need to have a bank statement. Do I have a statement? Understand policies and goals are important aspect of administrators. Compliance with the regulations I've already mentioned. A liaison with, please understand, your stakeholder is just not residents, they're families. When a person comes in, you should know where they're coming from. If you don't know how they came in, who are the relatives over a period of time, social worker can identify contact points. I think if you are not able to establish a contact point, the sad thing, but you should establish a contact point. You should really pursue this. And always, residents, engage with the residents continuously. Don't be without that. Develop a con I understand one thing. When I enter the building, I must see on the face of the people compassion. They care for me. I think that is something which is very important for us to understand. Develop a country. Safe, non slippery, walking, you know, corridors. Should have, you know, grade, it's a basic thing. Bars, bars, grab bars, minor things. Ensure safety is very important. Everything should be centric. Everything should be centric to old person who was regarding that. Nothing else. Absolutely. And pay personal attention to every resident. Go to the next, please. Yes. I'm going to skip this. I will leave this, skip this because it's what has been issued by the National Network of Social Work Managers. 
competent social work manager. I will skip this. Can I go to the next one? Now I'm going to actually complete it. This is the future for social gerontology professionals. Understand you are going to serve a lot of purpose in this community. If you want you, when you grow old, to be respected and feel dignified, understand you need to establish that today when you are young. And there's a great career pathway. And it, it is, let me tell you, as far as the financial results are concerned, it could be very attractive to committed people. It may not be attractive to non-committed people. But there's a huge, there is a huge opportunity for people to grow very well in this program. With this, I would close it. I'd be happy to ask any, any questions. I'd be very happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gangadharan, for that uh, very elaborate and, you know, presentation covering all areas of, uh, you know, managing old age homes or uh, senior citizen care homes. Excellent presentation. Couple of uh, questions are coming in. Uh, let me read out. There is a question from Manikumari Bala. Some of the agencies are not providing dietary food for them. How to rectify this problem? Your response, sir. No, I think this is an individual decision of the organization concerned. I think what has not happened till today is that nutrition for elderly is not given so much of importance as in a family, a rich, you know, what is called a sick person. I think when a sick person comes, you know, people go and ask the doctor what food I should take. Those days, I remember doctors used to tell, when you are sick, take kanji, you know, take garsi kanji, good for you, don't take anything else, or take bread, bread with milk. Or take buttermilk if it is a stomach is disorder. Those things were there. But today, all of us have become very conscious about our health, you know, food habits. Now, let me tell you, the government of India, is, when they are granting money, they are also specifying what menu menu to be given. And those menus, I understand, has been given by the nutritionist whom they consulted before they are declared in the document. I think if they are following that, I think they should give them a mal the, the food calories. Now, understand... The food calorie for a person who is an adult at the age of 40 or 50 is 2,200 calories. Whereas in the case of a sick person, old person could be as low as 1,200. The, the question is how conditional the body is. But let me tell you, we can always educate people. I think people can always contact us. Understand giving quality food does not cost more money. The question is permutation and combinations. Right. Thank you, Dr. Gangadharan. There is a question from uh, Dr. Mahendra Kumar. Is there evidence-based uh, research on ways to provide autonomy in older people from the family? Your Can response? I repeat the question? Repeat the question. Is there, is there any evidence-based research on ways to provide autonomy in older people from the family? Ways to provide. Waste. Ways, W A Y S, ways to provide. Provide? Autonomy. Yeah, let me tell you. See, let me tell you the autonomy is not something that the family provides you. Why should the family provide you the autonomy? As I grow old, I must know how to maintain my academy. I think there are people who are sitting in front of me. Let's let's I'm now seeing Dr. Nalini from Bangalore. I'm sorry, from Madurai. I think Dr. Nalini leads an excellent life for her life. She she chooses her life, she must be. As old as I am, or maybe one or two years younger or older. But she runs her life. Mrs. Gazala was retired from uh, government. I'm sure she runs her life of her choice. The family doesn't decide what she should run. The family comes into being when you start becoming dependent. I think till then you have an independent life. When you start becoming dependent, respect it. When you are becoming dependent, they have, you need to respect their time also. Their efforts also. You cannot say, I will have my own set. No, that's not fair. I think the balancing is very important. As a senior citizen, I must also respect the time of my children or grandchildren. That is very important. I expect my grandchildren to say, come and tell me at morning, 7.30 in the morning. Tata, I won't be able to do it. I'm very busy getting dressed up and I'm not coming. I'll come in the evening. I must not find fault. She's not seeing me. I said, okay. 
she's independent. She says, I will come and see you in the evening. I should respect it. Just because she's not listening to me, I should not become negative. I think it's an attitude. Right, right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gangadharan. There is a question from uh, Mr. Dean Dayalan. Uh, it's regarding COVID. Will it deter health assistance to support elderly care? We teach capability, not culpability. Your response, please. Yeah, but Dean, Dean is my senior. I have a lot of uh, nice Dean that you are there in this meeting. And uh, yes, I saw you coming in. Thanks that you came. But nice to have Dean Dialin is a two, two year super senior to me for Metal School Social Work. He's one of those very eminent uh, persons in uh, human resource management. So nice that he has come. And uh, let me tell you, uh, Dean, what we are happening right now in uh, COVID facilities, let us understand one thing. The government of India funded old age homes and also state government old age homes have been instructed not to let anybody new come into the old age homes. That is to ensure the existing people don't have risk to their lives. That's the first thing that we are doing. Number two, let me tell you, in our case in Hyderabad, the last three days time, extremely pathetic. We want to help, but we are not able to help. These three cases, we wanted to take them to our facility where we have some facilities. We, kept them. we have a quarantine facility, but we are not in a position to take them to quarantine because all of them, three, all the three have been tested positive. The moment the three are tested positive, if I want to take them to a phase where I have another 40, 42 people, I am going to put all the 42 people at risk. So I think it's we are finding it extremely difficult to balance. So what we are now very seriously considering is we have a building where we want to take all these people to the building, give them two weeks treatment, and then bring them. But the person that comes in, it's prohibitively expensive for us to take care of them. And families will find we are commercial. Please understand, when we want to serve them, they will say we are commercial. So we are caught in this you know, web of not doing. So old age homes in the districts, which are quite a number of my friends are in the old age program today, they cannot take a risk of taking anybody. They cannot take a risk of asking a doctor to come and see the people in resident homes because the doctor himself can carry and today we are finding we don't know who's a carrier. Asymptomatic is very case. So I think it's 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 uh, Dina, your question is going, going to be very thought provoking. But the fact remains, we are all very cautious. The interest of other residents who are already living there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jangadharan. Uh, Dr. Mahendra Kumar asked a couple of more questions. I will take one more question from him. How can a geriatric social worker help reduce the elderly cost of care? Cost of care, yeah. Yes. How can we reduce? Yeah, let me tell you. I think the government of India's national program for health care of the elderly has two major statements. One is healthy aging. Second is active aging. As long as we are able to adopt these two practices, the cost of health care is going to be minimum. If already, supposing I'm already taking medicine, I cannot stop it if it is for the brain or for the heart or for the blood pressure or for diabetes. I cannot stop it. But arising out of diabetes complications, I could probably prevent it, postpone bad things happening by remaining active and doing physical exercises and following this. So you're going to control it. Now, where do the social worker come in there? Social worker is one person. I'm sometimes rigid. I think Dr. Bacha mentioned beautifully, how oh, first two days he never talked to him. Third day he started asking, who are you, how are you? I think that is something very important. Two days, you're not going to be acceptable to people because you're talking to them. Don't eat this, don't eat this. Nobody likes me. If I want to eat an ice cream, if my granddaughter or my daughter comes and says, Abba, why do you want to take ice cream? I don't like it immediately. Because she now tells me in my interest. Now I start thinking she doesn't want to look after me. That's why she's asking. No, it is not that way. She's telling, why do you want to get into indiscipline problem of uh, you can control your ice cream? So, okay, you're interested in taking ice cream. Why don't you take it once a month? Okay, doctors have advised you not to take puri because it has a lot of oil. So, upper once in a way, you take once one once a month, you take two puris. But you don't say, I want vada every day, I want puri every day, I want oil stuff. No. I think this is something that people can prevent. Social workers can counsel them. Listen. Listening to the younger people, people is one people after I give birth to you. No. I think this is something that you need to balance. Social workers can be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gangadharan. I'm seeing a uh, doctor. Uh, uh, would you want to add any points, uh, Mr. Dean Dayalan? Your mic is on. Do you want to add any points? I, no. I want to say something. Outstanding. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. May I ask, uh, Ms. Ghazala, Ghazala Mina? She's uh, her mic. Yeah. Is on? Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Please. Yes. Go ahead. No. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dangatran, excellent presentation. And I think, uh, as uh, Dr. James said, all of us really benefited. And uh, uh, you know, it was a all-encompassing, you know, huge presentation and a lot of learning, at least for me. The only thing I wanted to say, because we have been talking about this for almost a fortnight, there is no, uh, I personally feel that we, should we not also counsel the elders? You see, we must have active counseling for elders also. Because you cannot, everything cannot be a matter of right and everything cannot be pity and everything cannot be self-pity also. So somewhere we will have to do a little bit of counseling of the elders also so that as time passes, I'm not saying let them, you know, uh, they should they should not retain their seniority or their respect, everything. Everything will be intact if only we could counsel the elders also on how to carry, you know, get along in a family, how to, you know, live, uh, how to make it easy for everybody. I think that is a very important thing that is missing. In fact, once I had also said in a help page meeting also that we must have counseling services for elders also. I think this elder abuse and all, a lot of things will reduce. Believe me, if we start counseling, it has to be on both sides. We cannot say that the, you know, the daughter-in-law is bad and then the son-in-law, uh, son is misbehaving and everybody is so happily quoting the help page report saying that so much of elder abuse. But there is another help page report which says that the daughter-in-laws are the ones who are looking after the parents. The caregiving part is being done by the daughter-in-laws. So I think a, a little balance has to come somewhere where we are talking about, you know, senior citizens in every aspect. Even if it is like you're talking about Puri or your Bada, you know, this some counseling has to go on because it cannot be us and them all the time. So, I mean, congratulations for a brilliant presentation. And I, I just thought that this is something I wanted to say for a long time that I think this is one aspect we should look into also. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, thank you so much. But uh, let me clarify two things to you. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful counseling seniors required. But I want to tell you something. Now there are two reports that we have. As far as the reports of uh, UNFPA report is concerned, the, the abuse reports are very different from that of the uh, help, uh, help page. Yeah. Now, as a person, I don't believe that should, we should sensationalize hmm. the incidents of abuse so much. It's not right. Exactly. Because exactly. you are not bringing in the reports the cause of the abuse, the senior mm. citizens themselves are responsible. Yeah. You are only telling Gangadharan is abused. But you don't understand. You don't tell why Gangadharan responded that. Exactly. exactly. The report is only one-sided. Therefore, for me, those reports are irrelevant. I don't quote them at all. As a mm. principle, I don't quote. Mm. I quote only UNFPA reports and those kinds of reports because some of these reports I don't feel comfortable because it's not true all the time. I told, I you, last, I told you I was never comfortable with elder abuse. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I don't want to dispute their capacities in terms of what they are contributing to elderly, but in respect of risk, I don't really use that because for me, it's not actually true. For me, it's not actually true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gangadharan. Excellent presentation. Due to paucity of time, we will not be able to take uh, any more questions. We are moving towards the end of the presentation and the session. Before we move on to the summing up and uh, proposing the water thanks, a couple of announcements. Tomorrow's session will be handled by Dr. Prince Anadure, Associate Professor, Department of Social Work, Madras Christian College, and the session will start at 11.30. And we also have tomorrow the validatory session. Validatory address will be given by Dr. Pamela Singla, Professor and uh, Head of the Department of Social Work, University of Delhi. And we have a guest of honor, Mr. Muniraj USB, Deputy Director of National Institution for Transforming India, Nidhi Ayok, Government of India. It is going to be a wonderful session. I request everyone to spread this message and also attend and join by 11.15. Please do not come and you know join after 11.30. It is very difficult for you to make people enter in. Now also I'm getting request that, you know, please allow me. I'm not getting any button to make people you know, enter inside. So thank you so much, everyone. You. And uh, we are coming to the end of uh, today's session. Organized, it's a part of six-day orientation program on gerontological social work organized by BDU Heritage Center for Gerontology, Department of Social Work, 
Haridas University, Tirisrapulli, Heritage Foundation of India, Hyderabad, Telangana, and Transcat People Solutions Private Limited, Bengaluru. Now, may I request uh, Professor Nalini, Professor Emeritus, Department of Sociology, Madurai Kamaraj University, to sum up the entire session and propose the vote of thanks. Let me introduce her. She has received many a senior fellowship. Uh, Fellowships from Indian Council of Social Science Research and has, she has written many books and traveled to many countries. She is an authority in this area. I welcome Dr. Nalini, Professor Emeritus, to conclude his, this session by summing up and proposing the vote of thanks. Professor Nalini. Sir, before that, just, yes. just before right. that, a couple of uh, uh, May I just come in? Uh, uh, Dr. Gangadhan, sir, it was a wonderful presentation, as everybody said. Uh, it's a very comprehensive. And, you know, uh, honestly, I was always having a desire to listen to management or leadership gurus like Shukera and, you know, John Maxwell. But today, I have the satisfaction of having listened to a management guru. Uh, so that, that was how, how it was. So I think you are uh, uh, really a uh, management guru in the field of senior citizens' uh, care management, sir. I think all that you said, uh, all your input should be documented in the form of a book uh, on senior citizens' care management for the benefit of you know, the gerontologists and people who will be taking up senior care management in our country. So thank you so much, Dr. Gangatha. Thank you, Professor Elango. And uh, maybe uh, move forward, request uh, Professor Nalini to yeah. come. Nalini, Professor Nalini, please. Manakam. Am I audible? Yes, yes, please yes. go ahead. Uh, Manakam, everyone. I am very happy to sum up the speech of Mr. Gangadharan. Um, Dr. Gangadharan is one of the earliest geriatric caregivers with a very good, very nice hospital. I am really proud to say that uh, I have visited his uh, heritage hospitals some 20 years back. Even at that time, uh, it, was, it, it gave, it provided uh, quality care to the elderly persons. Uh, coming to Sama, Professor, I mean, Dr. Gangadharan elaborated many things, starting from the type of assistance required by the elderly persons and uh, the type of disability they suffer from and passing on to several other facts like the social, economic and also the familial matters that are related to the care of the elderly per persons. Many facts and data provided by Dr. Gangadharan must be definitely useful for the newcomers to this uh, field. Definitely his speech would have inspired many people to give geriatric to the care to the needy people. Uh, I found himself uh, to be a combination of uh, an academician as well as an administrator because his presentation was full of uh, facts, details, and practical difficulties that are involved in geriatric care rather than a theoretical presentation and a hypoth hypothetical explanation normally we find in such presentations. He, uh, he not only explored the problems of the elders, but also the, all the issues relating to the stakeholders of the caregiving of the elders. Um, one important thing I want to tell here is that hospital administrators are in between the government and the people. They are between the government, the policy makers as well as the, uh, and the um, elders who are getting the care. Therefore, and also the family which is providing a supportive care to them. So therefore, the role of an administrator is very, very important. And that has been fully explained by Mr. Gangadharan. And um, um, 
one thing i want to tell you is i all i have been listening to him for several times and uh, i used to enjoy all the personal experiences he used to give whenever he speaks about many many big shots and many many personal experiences he had in his own heritage hospitals that i used to like very much and i think it was going to be useful for many others also i certainly like the one important point which i would like to tell you is uh, that old age is not really old age even i like that point very, um, <laughs> very much because uh, it does not the learning or working does not end at 60 even after 60 we can re engage and be productive and be happy to ourselves and keep on learning what are the chances if it may be we should keep on learning and that is going to give us uh, happiness and um, to end up i thank uh, professor dilango and also i'm sorry sir i do not know your name but master of ceremony professor or doctor i am really thankful for you for giving me this chance and also uh, dr gandhagran to be who remember me very well and also made a mention about me here and uh, it also has given me this opportunity i also thank all the others who are behind the screen and helping Mr. Gandhagaran and also Professor uh, Ilango uh, for keeping this session going on very well, and also all the participants for being alert. I've been listening to the chat. I've been watching the chat part of it, and many people are interested in asking questions and giving their responses. Uh, I thank them also. Once again, I thank everyone and anyways. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nalini Bala. Excellent summing up, and you know, proposing the water thanks. I am Dr. James Thomas from Transcare People Solutions Private Limited, one of the organizers. Thank you so much for coming in, and you know, uh, proposing the water thanks. And uh, I thank everybody. Thank uh, uh, Dr. Ganga Dren, Professor Ilango, uh, Ms. Kesara Minai, and all of this. i thank dr mangleshwaran and his entire team and all the officials from the bharatdas university and i thank all the participants we are coming to a close and let us meet tomorrow at 11:15 thank you so much